additional areas of uh, built up areas and instead of the buffer area being uh, a few hundred uh, meters it's going to be perhaps a kilometer in depth Indeed. Uh, let me just interrupt you there, Mr. Lurudi. I apologize, but for our viewers who are just watching, as you can see, that bombardment is continuing. It looks like a mass scale demolition under which, of course, we know children, women, the elderly, the disabled are all being crushed. These are the latest images you're seeing coming out of the Gaza Strip. This is Beit Hanun right now as we speak, just 15 minutes away from the Gaza, uh, from the central Gaza city. Uh, Mr. Lurudi, please continue. Yes, well, actually, that's the point. Beit Hanun is very close. <clears throat> it's, in, it's in the north. It's uh, in the area that's next to the buff existing buffer strip and it is being flattened. It's being flattened in order to widen the buffer strip, uh, create a no man's land, and squeeze now 1.8 million uh, Palestinians into an ever smaller area with fewer resources. Uh, they, they did the same, of course, to Shejaiya. That also, presumably, they will make arrangements so that it will never be rebuilt. And, and all of these people will be crammed into small, smaller and smaller spaces with less and less water and the idea is to make them die, to make them disappear, to make them go away. Uh, all this talk about creating a healthy uh, Gaza by removing the, uh, 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 the, the siege, uh, the last thing that, uh, that Israel wants to see is a thriving, economically viable uh, uh, Gaza that gives them respectability in the world and they don't want Palestinians to have respectability uh, right um, mr. Glenn I put this over to you as well right now uh, how concerned is Israel about its image uh, specifically at a time when the world's public opinion is so much against it and as we see these pictures and images coming out of Gaza it is hard to say if there is any image uh, of Israel that is left that it can save and salvage yeah, I, I would agree with Mr. Laredi that uh, there are some elements within the pro-Israel, uh, the pro-Israel group out there who are concerned with Israel's image. But we're talking about Benjamin Netanyahu here. This is a guy who is the uh, quintessential Armageddonist. Uh, he does not care what Israel looks like. He is one of these true believers uh, who thinks that uh, the God of Israel is going to see Israel through whatever. Uh, bumps in the road she happens to go through as long as they remain faithful uh, and uh, and carry out God's uh, decree here to rid the promised land of, uh, of non-Jews. So I would agree with uh, Mr. Larity that there are uh, smarter elements, particularly those in the West, uh, who are being made very uh, uh, nervous and uncomfortable with what's going on, but not Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu uh, if, if he really were nervous, uh, he would uh, cease, he would pull back, he would, he would try to make it believable that he's only targeting militants and that he's not deliberately, deliberately targeting uh, women and children. He's not doing that. He's going all out here. He is, uh, in fact, this is, it reminds me of a scene from a movie uh, called The Untouchables where uh, the character playing Al Capone takes a baseball bat to the back of the head of one of his associates in front of uh, the entire group they're all dressed in tuxedos and he does this in order to make an example of this guy because this guy happened to do something that uh, Al Capone didn't find uh, agreeable uh, and uh, just absolutely beats this man death in front of everyone to make an example of him and I do believe that that is one of the uh, goals that Netanyahu is doing here uh, particularly given the fact that he has been so uh, shamed and embarrassed by uh, no less than uh, a black uh, American president who refuses to go to war against Iran and to carry out uh, many of uh, Netanyahu's I'm sorry, let me just stop you there, Mr. Parts. Glenn. Our viewers who are joining us right now, you can see those images uh, coming out of Gaza. It is total destruction right now. Every area is being bombarded. All we can see are clouds of smoke engulfing the entire region. It's hard to tell that there were even buildings over there. Uh, you can see uh, the bombs landing, uh, the explosions, and the resulting uh, uh, aftermath of it right now. Uh, Beit Hanun being pulverized uh, by uh, the Israeli forces. We are just uh, l a little less than 
20 minutes to go before a humanitarian ceasefire was supposed to set in. Uh, we are going to have to wait and see what this means for this UN ceasefire um, and, of course, the people of Gaza. Uh, uh, Mr. Glenn, I do apologize for interrupting you there. Please go ahead. No problem. I basically made my point. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things that Netanyahu wants also, and we do have to consider this because he is a gangster, he is a thug, he does speak uh, in that peculiar dialect known as gangsteries. Uh, I also think that this is his way of sending warnings to uh, the leaders of the various uh, countries in the West and really throughout the world, that this is what, this is what we will do to you in some fashion. Uh, maybe we won't bombard your country the way that we're doing Gaza, but maybe we'll set off a suitcase nuke or uh, some type of uh, terrorist attack. I think that he's out to show uh, not just the world, that he, not the world, not only that he's ruthless, but that he's willing to go to these lengths uh, against other countries who are ostensibly supporters of Israel. Uh, he's a very dangerous man, and as I've said before, I don't think that there's ever been a period in human history where we have stood on the precipice of destruction as closely as we are now, and it is in large part due to him. All right, let me cross back over to the Gaza Strip. Our correspondent, Hisham Mahenna, is standing. Uh, Oh, I apologize. Uh, we do not have that connection established. We'll try and get him back up for you, of course. Uh, Mr. Larudi, uh, I'll put this question to you now. As we look at the destruction and the extent of it, one has to wonder what is this objective over here? Uh, at first, it was uh, declared by Israel to stop the rockets from falling into Israel. Then it was uh, expanded into saying they want to destroy the tunnels. Uh, then it it not right now it stands at demilitarizing Hamas and finishing off the resistance. However, there are certain calls uh, within Israeli political elite and circles uh, that are saying that we cannot finish off the resistance this way. What needs to be done is a complete destruction of the Gaza Strip, a relocation of the remainder of the population, and Israel taking over its quote-unquote sovereignty and extending it to the entire Gaza Strip. Uh, how do you assess that? Well, there are all kinds of lies and speculations that are being thrown around. Um, I, if For anyone who's followed it for decades, um, you can see that the objective of Israel, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's Netanyahu or, or uh, Perez or, or Rabin, or it doesn't matter, any of them, the objective is to get rid of all the Palestinians. That's the objective. Please, let's keep that in the back of our minds. And that is exactly what they're doing to Beit Hanun right, uh, right now. And that's exactly what they did in uh, Shijaiya. And I, I firmly believe that if they get their way, uh, which they usually do, this is, uh, they are going to make this permanent. And they're going to squeeze uh, the Palestinians into a smaller and smaller area. Uh, and periodically it's going to explode. Uh, uh, or if it doesn't do it on a timely manner, then uh, Israel will explode it itself as it did this time. It didn't have to invade, but it did. So I, I think that uh, the idea of, of taking over all of Gaza, yes, they want to take over Gaza and get rid of the Palestinians in Gaza. Um, but whether they'll do it now or they'll do it another time, I think they actually prefer to keep Hamas there. They need an enemy that they can demonize and that they can use an, as an excuse for war. And as I've said before, uh, the, the, uh, the Israelis need every Israeli to participate in the genocide as part of the culture of Israel, as, as a, the stormtrooper culture. They need their young people to, be, to uh, join in the, the national pastime of, uh, of genocide and to feel that they have done the same thing that their older brothers and sisters and uncles and father and mother that they've all done and it's considered normal in Israel. Uh, geno the genocide of the Palestinians, it's considered normal the same way that the genocide of the American Indians uh, in North America was considered normal. This is this is the project. Let's not let's not have any illusions, please.
Indeed, this uh, legacy of occupation is entrenched within the Zionist ideology. Uh, um, Mr. Glenn, I'd like uh, for you to share your thoughts uh, on this as well. Do you see uh, this uh, basically Netanyahu or whoever is in government uh, planning to basically uh, expand its uh, control base uh, over to the Gaza Strip? Sure. Uh, let's not forget that uh, the Israelis from the beginning never planned on holding onto some little slice of land along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, they, are, they are following a written plan here, and of course that written plan uh, is what is laid out in the uh, Old Testament. And it says everything between the Nile and the Euphrates, the two blue lines on the Israeli flag, uh, that's what those two blue lines signify, the Nile and the Euphrates, and that happens to include Gaza. So uh, yes, they, 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 especially the right wing, they have absolutely been uh, just bristling over the fact that, uh, that Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005. They consider this to be no less than, than heresy, the fact that Israel would, would give over a piece of land uh, to non-Jewish people. Uh, and that this is somehow, uh, that this, as I said, this is a blasphemy, this is a, a slap in the face of, uh, of the Jewish God. And so, yes, I, I can see uh, a situation where they would move in there and they would take the area over. If not, then I think that Mr. Uh, Larity is correct in that and that they will keep Hamas there because they do. They have to have uh, some type of uh, uh, boogeyman out there all the time so that whenever you know, this organically fractured society begins tearing itself apart, uh, they can uh, they can start some new military operation and then all, all of a sudden everybody forgets about the family feud that's going on and now they're concentrating uh, on the uh, object at hand which is killing uh, these uh, innocent people so uh, it's uh, again this is and the sad thing about this the tragic thing about this is that all of this was perfectly predictable uh, this is no different than the farmer uh, agreeing to allow the fox to guard the hen house and then coming out in the morning and seeing all his chickens dead and he's he's absolutely surprised shocked uh, that this would happen well of course it's in the fox's nature to do this uh, likewise when it comes to israel when it comes to zionism we're talking about an ideology here that has no compunctions whatsoever about shedding innocent blood uh, this is something that is thousands of years ingrained in this culture, not just a few decades, but thousands of years. And uh, and so it's, as I said before, it's a very dangerous situation. Personally, the thing that concerns me is that uh, after Netanyahu emerges from this thing victorious amongst his own people, uh, he's really going to be feeling the, the the muscle here. He's and so what does that mean? Is he going to put uh, additional pressure on Obama to begin some type of military operations against Iran? Uh, there's no telling what he'll do because he is a ra he's a mad dog. There's there's no better comparison to use than that. He's he's absolutely out of his mind. But Mr. Larudi, maintaining Hamas uh, for whatever purposes, isn't that dangerous, so to speak, for Israel, specifically when you look at how Hamas has surprised Israel uh, with its defensive capabilities uh, this war around? Um, Hamas uh, has effectively used some of the tactics of uh, Hezbollah, but it is not Hezbollah. It doesn't have access to the outside, to get the arms and uh, uh, supplies. It, it, it doesn't have access to the outside world. It's under, it's living in a prison. It's a miraculous uh, what they've done. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I'd like to just say, there was an incident uh, today in uh, Beit Ammar in the West Bank. Uh, uh, that's very telling. We know about the big demonstration and all this sort of thing, and uh, that it was met with brutal force when, in fact, it was a, a nonviolent re demonstration. But the uh, in in the small village of Beit Ammar, uh, between uh, Hebron or Al Khalil and uh, and Jerusalem, the uh, uh, there there was a demonstration. They've been carrying on nonviolent peaceful demonstrations for years there and this is this is their experiment on trying to end the occupation uh, and uh, putting the um, and they had this uh, their demonstration well for the first time for the very first time the Israeli forces that have been out there every week 
and have fought them back with tear gas uh, and, and other uh, non-lethal uh, means. Shot three of them through the heart. Shot three of these non-violent demonstrators that they know very well through the heart. They're not afraid of missiles. They're not afraid of, of guns or anything like this because they know that these people are not going to harm Israeli soldiers. They know that. But they're tired of Palestinians. They're tired of Palestinians behaving in, in, uh, in a nonviolent way. And they, they took this opportunity because all of the attention is on Gaza. And they, uh, and they thought, now we can get rid of these troublemakers that have been bothering us for years. That's it. It was murder. It was pure murder. We know about murder in Gaza. But there's no excuse for, uh, for this. It's just simply an opportunity to kill Palestinians. And this is what they're all about. That's it. Well, speaking of murder, let's not forget Israel has been uh, uh, involved in violence against Palestinians, not just in the Gaza Strip, but also in the West Bank. Uh, we have seen uh, the Palestinians incur massive casualties. And let's not forget uh, the uh, many Palestinians who are languishing in Israeli jails, a lot of them without charge, without lawyer, without uh, any legal representation. Uh, now, Mr. Glenn, uh, as we're seeing the West Bank rise as well against the Israeli aggressions, there are some who are saying that this is the beginning and the makings of a third intifada, the like of which uh, Israel has never seen before. Uh, do you see it that way? Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, if you leave a uh, pot on the stove long enough and turn the heat on, uh, eventually it's going to blow. And uh, the Palestinians who have uh, endured what really no other people in, in human history have had to endure, at least in terms of length, uh, it, you know, it's the longest military operation in history. And uh, they're up against the most uh, brutal, uh, amoral, uh, as Mr. Laherty said, killing Palestinians is a national pastime. And so, uh, yeah, when you're, when you're dealing with people who are that desperate, uh, who feel like they have nothing left to lose, then uh, yes, you can see easily that they would be uh, pushed into uh, initiating a new intifada. Uh, it's uh, really, honestly, um, Kanis, I am speechless at what I have witnessed personally in the last few weeks, as well as many of my associates and others sitting by and watching this and then seeing, really, despite the fact that much of the world has... Uh, uh, really reacted with uh, outrage over this. The silence of the Western leaders. Where, where is the Pope in all of this? I mean, this is the man who is supposed to speak for uh, over a billion Christians, uh, and uh, he's absolutely silent as death. And you know, and when we when we consider this, consider the silence. You know, I, I was just thinking about this earlier tonight. Uh, you know, if the situation were reversed, and let's say that uh, a, a big country such as Russia or China or even Iran. Uh, somehow decided to make war against uh, Israel and somehow miraculously uh, knocked out her ability to, to fight back. She didn't have an air force, she didn't have any missiles, and, uh, and they were doing to Israel what Israel is doing to Gaza right now. Would we see these Western leaders simply scratching their heads and saying, oh, we're concerned about this, we're watching this very closely? No, the F-16s would be in the air, the aircraft carriers would be on their way. Uh, it would be 1956 all over again with an airlift of, uh, of arms and supplies. And it really just goes to underscore the utter moral bankruptcy of the West, that they can sit back and they can allow what really is an exercise in human sacrifice, no different than what the Aztecs and the Mayans and other primitive cultures did in the years past, Indeed. where they would kill innocent people in order to appease their bloodthirsty god. Okay, uh, that was Mark Glenn, author and journalist, joining us uh, via Skype from Idaho. Also from Berkeley was uh, the co-founder of the Free Palestine Movement, Paula Rudy. Gentlemen, thank you for your comments uh, with regards to our special coverage of the ongoing uh, assaults on uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, for our viewers who are joining us right now, just a quick reminder, live pictures you're getting uh, coming out of the Gaza Strip. The, Beit Hanun region is being pulverized by Israeli tank shelling and airstrikes. We can see those uh, strikes, the plumes of smoke. Uh, it, is, it looks like a systematic demolition of the homes. Uh, of course, Palestinian children, women, civilians, the elderly, the disabled are the ones who are going to bear the brunt of this. The civilian casualties will increase exponentially uh, as we see the 
uh, demolition of an entire area in the Gaza Strip. Beit Hanun is only 15 minutes drive away uh, from central Gaza City. This is a massive escalation uh, in the Israeli onslaught on the Gaza Strip. We're less than four minutes away from a UN humanitarian ceasefire uh, from coming into effect. We're going to have to wait and see uh, whether this pounding, this shelling, this indiscriminate killing is going to be halted for a few hours come uh, in, in these four minutes. Uh, we will keep you up to date, of course, here on Press TV. Those are the lies Im live images you're getting uh, coming out of the Gaza Strip. Stay tuned to Press TV uh, for more coming out of Gaza. Our correspondents standing by on the ground with the very latest. There's PressTV.ir for a minute-by-minute update, too. At least 20 people were killed in a single Israeli airstrike of the southern town of Khan Yunus. Those who were killed were all members of the same family, including several children. A Palestinian also died from his injuries in Beit Lahia. The UN says over 80% of the Palestinian fatalities have been civilians, including more than 200 children. Meanwhile, a temporary ceasefire has gone into effect to allow the delivery of humanitarian supplies to the area. The temporary truce, which was reached through the UN mediation, began at 500 hours at GMT and will last for 12 hours. Let's speak to our correspondent, Hisham Mahanna, uh, who joins us live from Gaza. Now, Hisham, uh, two minutes into the ceasefire, have the guns been silenced? Well, these two minutes are now the most furious, the most dangerous, the most escalating since the, since the, the beginning of this uh, of this day. Uh, the, death toll, the death toll of uh, uh, a Najjar family in Khan Yunus has been uh, has reached 20, 20 people now. Most of them are children and women. The uh, the medical staff and the civil defense could pull off uh, 20 bodies from there, and they are still looking for any more casualties under fire. Uh, the situation is escalating in the north. There is heavy artillery covered by uh, airstrikes. It seems to be that there is uh, very dangerous and se serious clashes between the resistance and the, uh, the Israeli military forces on the ground. They are covering the, the, they are covering the, uh, the, the, the Th those areas with smoke so they can uh, evacuate their casualties which are considered to be uh, in big numbers actually not nothing has been confirmed yet and uh, not no no killed soldiers has been confirmed yet at the moment but it's also uh, escalating in the no in the east of the Gaza Strip uh, in al Shajaya and al Zaytun as well as the uh, there is uh, the uh, Navy warships are, are bombing heavy shelling from them from the sea towards the city in uh, Deir al-Balah in the middle of the Gaza Strip it's very, very dangerous. It's escalating. And we don't think that we are going to witness any ceasefire any soon. Right now, Hisham, as we look at the live images, it looks like Gaza is on fire. There are plumes of smoke coming out. Uh, we earlier saw uh, bombardment, heavy shelling take place, entire buildings and neighborhoods being demolished uh, by the Israeli forces. Uh, this is, of course, uh, let's not forget, indiscriminate now, isn't it? Civilians, schools, mosques. Hospitals are all under uh, the uh, are all considered legitimate targets by Israel. This is true, and actually, the Israeli military has announced that the people who were evacuated from the city, from the from the areas like Shijaya and Khan Yunus and Khuza, are not allowed to go back to their homes, uh, even if the ceasefire is valid. Uh, this is. This, is, this warning has been has been serious has has been seriously confirmed by the local authorities here uh, that people are not allowed to come back to their homes even in the ceasefire. Uh, this is, this is different uh, though in, in many different areas like in the south and in the north in Beit Hanun, which is on fire now. That people who, who whose whose homes are partially damaged are allowed to come back to their homes, collect their things within the ceasefire. But if the situation continues like this, we are going to witness much more bloodshed, much more. Uh, casualties in, 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 the, in the civilians of Gaza Strip. And uh, very quickly, if you can, Hisham, uh, as these civilians flee their own homes, 
uh, because of heavy Israeli bombardment, where are they supposed to go? The Gaza Strip is under siege. You cannot leave the enclave. Uh, and it's a small area. Where do the people go? The people have absolutely no way out of their homes now. They have been trying to reach every single person they can, calling, asking for help, asking for aid to be evacuated. The heavy, bombard, the heavy bombardment, the continuous bombardment wouldn't allow anybody to go there and help them. They are entrapped in their houses and they are going to be targeted any soon. This okay. is very dangerous for the civilians in those areas. Okay, Press TV is Hasham Mahanna. They're reporting from the Gaza Strip. Hasham, thank you very much indeed. We're five minutes, uh, or six minutes rather, into the so called uh, UN brokered ceasefire. We saw heavy bombardment of the Gaza Strip take place. Uh, and from what my understanding was, the uh, area of Beit Hanun. As we spoke, at the Gazan resistance movements, of course, the Palestinian resistance movements in Gaza, putting up a fight in a northern Beit Hanun and different areas of it. However, uh, Israel continuing to bombard uh, the coastal enclave. We're going to have to wait and see whether this ceasefire.